Good morning, dobre utra, as I should say here in the native language. I'm not quite sure what date it is. I never am, so <clears throat> I believe it's the 20th of uh, of November 2022. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I have time, so I you know I can I can uh, walk around and talk a little bit, you know, about what I've been seeing in the news and <clears throat> maybe some of the things that I've been hearing, like a little bit in uh, Russian news, not really. I haven't been watching Belarusian news. Actually, I don't watch television, so I uh, I don't get any of that. And uh, mostly the Belarusian news, unless it's about local local occurrences, is normally not much different on global affairs as what the Russian news would be putting out. But uh, I even took notes this time. I have to have to get them out. <laughs> and I didn't even review them, so probably have to look at these before I even start start talking about this stuff. Yes, well, what I'd, a few things I'd like to mention, you know, some things that are maybe not being mentioned in some of the other online blogs in, uh, you know, Western speaking countries. One of them is that uh, there was an article, apparently, um, well, it was, in, it was in Der Spiegel, but it was a uh, I didn't find it online. I didn't find it in English. And, well, I didn't find it in German. I didn't look for it in English, but I, but, uh, but it was, I guess, in Russian, translated into Russian, and I, uh, I believe that it would be accurate, and I don't think they would make this up because they mention a lot of names, and it was about um, some talk that uh, there's, there's a uh, <clears throat> high general. I'm not quite exactly sure uh, exactly if they have these... Uh, same sort of rankings with general, you know, like brigadier and and uh, lieutenant and major general and then general. So, and then during time of war, I guess we'd have the general of the army. But it was a high general, high-ranking general. His name is uh, Eberhard Zorn, and um, he wrote a plan for the for the future of the military in Germany. And it was uh, uh, to modernize the Bundeswehr, which is the defense force of Germany. That's the name, and. Uh, get it ready for a war with Russia. <laughs> so apparently there are at least a lot of minds in the in the German military that want to prepare to make war upon Russia and uh, you can imagine what that's going to be all about. It's probably also to mainly just it was <laughs> it's sort of like if you remember or if you've ever studied uh, World War II and uh, and the uh, I don't know. Not supposed to say Nazi on uh, YouTube. Apparently, I don't know. A lot of people don't. But um, anyway, but what they did is very early in the war, after the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, they <clears throat> they went into Norway, and that was the first use of uh, airborne troops. You know, when the first time that they dropped soldiers out of airplanes with parachutes. But the reason why they went to Norway and, and took Norway is is to secure the oil supply. And I'm not saying that. Germany's trying to create another Third Reich or Fourth Reich, I guess. Uh, but uh, they're probably realizing, and they, you know, even before it really, really hits them, that they're uh, they made some big mistake, you know, as I say, like putting their money on the wrong horse and believing that the United States was going to be able to, uh, and allies, and you know, just the West in general, the EU, maybe you could say. So I'm not privy to what they're what their original plans are, but it's very obvious that that the whole idea, and it has been, and it probably has been for many decades, is to collapse Russia and then go in and take the spoils, just like they did during the time of Boris Yeltsin, is to, uh, you know, not just to neutralize Russia, but to, uh, you know, take their resources and uh, have control over those. And they didn't do a very good job, apparently, during the time of Boris Yeltsin, uh, because uh, Boris Yeltsin I believe he appointed Putin, more or less, and uh, Putin is able to, you know, bring back sovereignty to Russia. Russia's a big place. It's very difficult to, to try to take over it, and and there's always been this uh, plan and and actions to at least uh, demilitarize the Crimea. And I'm thinking, I'm almost positive that this, because you can see from the actions, uh, you have to just look at actions and this whole you know, provocation of uh, getting Russia to go out into Ukraine and all this is for the United States to secure the Crimea. I've been saying that in a lot of videos and I don't know why a lot of uh, people in vlogs don't really 
don't really mention that. But as you see, the majority of all the tax and all the concentration is all to try to get the Crimea. And as you know, the people of the Crimea have always been Russian. It's only a very, very short time in history, you know, since 1954 that Khrushchev gifted the Crimea to Ukraine. And back then, people didn't really care so much because it was just the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, and Ukraine was actually the brothers of uh, Russia to a large extent. But, you know, it's, it's a large history and you got to be looking back. And, and um, these uh, Russian-hating people in Ukraine, they've always existed even before World War II, even before Nazism. Uh, even though it was it was minor and it was mostly uh, confined to Galicia, which is in the further western part, west of uh, of Kiev, but uh, um, you know it was it was a lot smaller back then. And of course they hate, you know, it's it's very strange because they 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 create a, a people uh, where their society is based on hatred of other people, you know, and it's like they hated the Jews and you know, and as you know the. Uh, alleged crimes and which parts of them really are true which of course there apparently are a lot of things true about what happened what the german nazis were doing but the worst crimes against jews were beyond any doubt perpetrated by those people that follow that ideology in the ukraine so i have to i try to be careful not to say ukraine because uh uh you know obviously most of the people there are just the same as the rest of us are and uh, they don't have really any interest in, in and, and they're smart enough to realize that just because of somebody, somebody's blood or something that they're not really some sort of inferior people or not. I, I, hope, I hope everybody watching this is not feeling that way. You get some people that are that way from Ukraine watching maybe my videos. I, I, early on I had them and, uh, and I even see people in, uh, in Britain I, I, and that just shocks me. They have them in the United States as well and they're, they're they're uh, actually Nazis, you know, and um, and you see this ideology, at least something related to that, taking over many places in the world, the Baltic states, Poland, it's 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 even in France and and maybe Germany and uh, uh, Scott Ritter, whose uh, contribution to you know free speech and and uh, all this information on the inter internet is is talking about in his hometown area they have they have Nazi parades and people wearing swastikas and all that in the United States so it's all just mind-boggling but I don't know about this general Eberhard in Germany what his mindset is and uh, when I was in Germany everybody was uh, very 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 defensive about uh, what I don't know not the word defensive offensive I guess you would say about people that support this Nazi ideology so I don't know about now. It's just, this is, it's just something like, like the snap of a finger. I can't do it, it's too cold out here. But snap your fingers and they go from being anti-Nazi to being pro-Nazi. Or at least uh, not saying they're pro-Nazi, but based on their actions, they're pro-Nazi. You know, these governments and all that. And it's not, it's not like you can deny that they don't know what really was going on, that the, that the Western Ukraine has been bombarding Donbass for, for eight years and what that it's alleged to believe that they killed 14,000 people you know and then just to ignore that and say oh no no oh it's all fake <laughs> you know we know I don't but that's not what I'm trying to get into right now the uh, but there's another article as well and I guess it was from Sky News even originally it was the general Vladimir uh, did I spell this wrong see if I wrote it down here uh, Gra Gavrilov, who is the uh, deputy minister of defense for Ukraine, you know, is saying that uh, within six months they could have uh, the uh, no wait wait a minute that's that's even it's it's even sooner than that. They said that by the end of December they should be able to take the Ukraine or take the Crimea from the Russians by the end of December. You know, that's just uh, you could even say weeks from now. It's it's. It's a little more than a month. You know, talk about optimism. And then they said that they should have the Russians defeated by uh, springtime. And I think that's, uh, I wrote it down here. I, it's like six months. In six months, they should have the Russians defeated. You know? And, the, but the reason, you know, his, his uh, justification for that is, uh, let's see if I find this here. He says, uh, uh, 
due to a black swan event. And if you don't know what they mean by a black swan event, that's a, uh, a sudden and unexpected event within Russia, he was saying. So what is that? Is this some kind of a, uh, a threat? I, I, you know, you can take it as you will, but it's uh, something you just, you have to keep in the back of your mind. You know, it, maybe this guy's just some crazy knucklehead, like there's a whole bunch of them around in the world today. But uh, coming out with something like this, coming out with something like saying that they're, that he's expecting like a black swan event. And, and of course it will uh, unseat Putin and, uh, and all that. But it's, uh, uh, you know, it's like a bizarre prediction that, that something catastrophic is going to happen in Russia. And the only thing I can really think of, and I've been suspecting quite a bit, is, you know, when you hear about all these uh, bio labs that Ukraine was operating, and I think uh, some people are saying up to 46 bio labs. And, and I'm, I'm just hoping, you know, I mean, if for everybody's sake, that it's not going to be some sort of a bio weapon, like, a, like a, a, a far more deadly virus than, you know, the coronavirus, which turned out not to be very deadly at all. It's mostly just a lot of fake news. But, uh, you know, at the very beginning, there was some, some things going on. And, and uh, you know, like, like the, these, uh, the, the medication that they put in your arms turns out to be a lot more deadly than the virus itself. I don't know, am I allowed to say virus? I don't, I don't have so many viewers on my YouTube channel, so I don't know if they watch me and maybe, you know, get me some strike or something like that. I don't know. But I think they are starting to watch me now on YouTube. You know, 300 some subscribers, not very much. Anyway, you know, but uh, Black Swan event, boy, oh boy, oh boy, you know, and I've been suspecting any some sort of a, uh, a t an attack like this anyway. You know, they've already done this actually. Somehow there was a, a, a viral infection in Krasnodar, like I mentioned in some other videos um, some years ago. And they did use uh, something in uh, the area of uh, Chechnya, and uh, a lot of the wildlife was killed there. You know, some sort of an aerial, aerial attack from some aerial virus, and you know that's not seemed to be mentioned much of anywhere either. But that's actually happened, and I believe Scott Ritter even put out that they've used avian flu, you know, to, uh, you know, to for against uh, poultry and and things like that against Russians or or or. Ukraine's enemies, and, you know, for some reason, that none of this stuff is getting mentioned. I, I don't, I don't really know. You know, I'm glad that Scott Ritter at least mentioned it, and uh, you know, you hear some things about that, but I don't know. A lot of vloggers, maybe they think it's not so important. I don't know, but uh, let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, well, actually, a lot about this uh, this missile attack in uh, in Poland, where it killed two people, and uh, I think the leader, I think it was Duda, the leader of Poland, is saying, oh, it's just an accident. But uh, Russia says they have no... <laughs> and, and well, I mean, let, let's back up a little bit. It's been known now that it was actually Ukraine that, that did that, even though Ukraine's trying to blame Russia. And Zelensky says, uh, oh, there's no way my defense people say that uh, we had nothing to do with this. But uh, it turns out that it's a Ukrainian missile. And then Duda said, oh, it's just an accident. You know, and they say it was from an S-300, so they're acting like uh, like uh, Ukraine was trying to shoot down some sort of a Russian missile because there was heavy, heavy, I guess some of the heaviest missile bombardment from Russia at that time. Uh, you know, during that, that night, I guess, was whenever that was, it was uh, shot off. And it was an S-300, which was made in the Soviet Union, but Russia apparently doesn't use those anymore. I was thinking it was always for more of the short range, but uh, anyway. It was from Ukraine, and uh, uh, Duda, the leader of Poland, is acting as if Ukraine was trying to shoot down a Russian missile, and it missed the missile, and of course landed into Poland. But Russia has nothing over there. They launched no attacks, and have nothing, nothing to launch attacks with in that area. So it was obviously a provocation by Ukraine, and obviously, as you can suspect, it's, uh, it's to try to point this on Russia, you know, seeing as it was a Russian-made S-300, even though the satellites imagery and all that, even, it's, it's, it's incredible that the United States even admits, and, and, and Poland admits that it was Ukraine that actually fired that, 
I, I find that really startling. I, I can't even believe that because so many times when it's actually been done by either Ukraine or somebody in the West, and they still always try to pin it on Russia, you know, even though backed on no evidence, and then they ignore all evidence that, uh, you know, that that it was somebody else that did these things. So I, I don't really understand that they actually admit that it was Ukraine that did it this time. It's just, it's just, it's just unbelievable. But anyway, this uh, false flag, I was going to, my hands are getting really cold, so I don't know if I can be doing this. I don't have gloves on. I, I, for some reason, I, I can't function that well with gloves. So, but I was going to try to make a correlation between uh, this false flag attack and uh, the attack on the USS Liberty in 1967. It was in, uh, in the summertime. And of course, now we're, we're going into the wintertime. But that is really a, a startling, a startling uh, event in history. You know, and it was uh, what I didn't know, and I found out recently because I I did a little bit of research, you know, for this video, and it's uh, it's just over compelling evidence that that the U.S. was was uh, involved in this attack on the USS Liberty, and I was thinking it was only Israel, but what it what happened was there was a, a U.S. spy ship just uh, monitoring what was going on off the coast of Egypt at that time. It was the Six-Day War between Israel and uh, and Egypt. And the leader, of course, uh, of Egypt at the time was Nasser. And uh, they were just monitoring it and, uh, you know, a relaxing thing and listening in and finding out, you know, what's what's going on. And uh, the Israeli planes would come by and Americans would wave at them and they'd wave back. And then all of a sudden they stopped waving. And then all of a sudden they started attacking this and uh, uh, vicious attacks. They had two waves of attacks and as people were trying to flee the uh, the Israelis, they machine gunned the uh, the life rafts and uh, you know killing. I can't remember how many people they killed. Seventy four, I, I believe. I, I I didn't. I was going to look that up this morning and, and uh, mention that, but I I forgot to do that. You know, getting Brandon brain here. And uh, but I believe seventy four people died in that attack. And uh, and if you find out all of the, I I don't know if you call it. It's not diplomacy all the dirty, dirty policy that, that followed that attack. It was, it's just incredible. President Johnson called off a rescue mission. There, there were ships trying to go to, to rescue that ship and they actually did make it there and they got off some of the wounded and put them on ships, I believe, uh, you know, where part of the attack was launched was uh, the USS America. And um, I think, um, they mentioned some of these names. There's a the USS Saratoga, um, and, um, you know, and there's even witnesses, a person named Brad uh, Nickenbacher. He was one of the pilots, but he he actually didn't launch, but they had launched uh, four other planes initially. And maybe there were like 20 planes involved in this um, afterwards because other uh, other uh, military commanders like captains of ships and all, they they heard about this attack and, you know, without orders, they were launching planes uh you know, to at least protect the liberty, the USS Liberty. But four planes were launched with nuclear weapons and they were going to drop a nuclear bomb. The United States was going to drop nuclear bombs on Cairo, Egypt. And uh, it was only seven minutes away. They were seven minutes away from nuclear bombs being dropped on Cairo, Egypt. And if you look at close calls, nuclear calls uh, um, online, you, you won't even mention this. They, I mean, they won't even mention this. It's just, uh, this is, it's one of the, <laughs> the most shameful parts of U.S. history, of modern U.S. history, and and you don't find anything. And, and records are being stricken, and they, they destroyed all the records on these ships. And uh, this Brad Nickenbacher was talking uh, years later about how they were training beforehand. See, that was some of the information that proved that the United States was was involved in the planning of this, and this was not just some sort of a uh, mistaken identity, uh, as they I think originally said that the Israelis thought that that was an Egyptian ship, and so they fired. You know, and then, even though they were waving to the Americans as American flag, and it wasn't even involved in any hostile actions or anything, it was just sitting out there. And uh, yeah, it's 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 a it, it's if you're an American, you know, it'll it'll it kind of makes you sick, it makes you sick when you read this sort of stuff, you know. And this was 1967, and remember, not 
long before that, you had Operation Northwoods um, and the assassination of Kennedy. And then right before that, President Eisenhower was, you know, in his farewell address was mentioning uh, to watch out for the power of the military industrial complex. And uh, then you're looking at this, uh, this war in Ukraine and uh, this FTX scandal where all this money is being made. And uh, you hear these, uh, these words like the, the plan is to bleed Russia white. In other words, to keep the war going. And then you see the words that uh, Julian Assange said, you know, but uh, years ago, like the war in Afghanistan, there, there is no plans. There was no plans to win that war. The plan was to keep the war going. In other words, for the military industrial complex to continue making bombs and to make lots and lots of money. That's just something you gotta, you gotta keep in mind. I, I still had a lot of uh, information I, that I read here, or that I wrote here about the USS Liberty. But anyway, they were trying to sink this ship. I hate to say it, the United States, some elements in the United States government, let me make that clear, some elements, just like some elements in Ukraine is responsible for what is really going on here, as well as other elements from foreign countries besides Ukraine. You all, every, you all know this stuff. You wouldn't be watching this if you didn't know this. But uh, but some of these elements in the United States um, that, that were planning this, it's, it's very obvious that they were going to sink this ship and make sure that everybody on board did not survive. Everybody had to die. That's why they were machine, Israel was machine gunning these life rafts. And you have to really wonder what was going on there. At that time, Nasser had rejected uh, um, the assignment of a new ambassador to Egypt from the United States. I don't know if the United States took that as some sort of a insult. You know, there's this hegemony you know, on the side of other people. And then you look at President Johnson and, uh, you know, make me president and I'll give you your blankety damn war. And, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I, I'm not going to go into all this that I wrote down here, even though it's so fascinating. It is so very, very fascinating that you, uh, you know, that you, that you look into the USS Liberty and everything surrounding that and you, you'll start to, find out, you know, the vast amount of corruption that was even going on back in those times. It's not just that it's going on now. And, you know, and then you find out a little bit more about uh, Operation Northwoods. And then there was the Levon Affair. And this was all happening back then in 1967. And what makes you think that this sort of thing does not happen today, you know? But I should end it right there. And, uh, Again, I sure I, I would have loved to uh, to talk more about the USS Liberty. It would make this quite a bit longer video, M but my fingers are pretty damn cold. You know, I can barely hold this piece of paper here that I haven't even been reading. That I, you know, knowing all this, but uh, yeah. But what saved the uh, this whole situation? I, I, let me mention that about the USS Liberty, is that uh, there was some of these these people that. Uh, brave people somebody I guess climbed outside um, on the deck and climbed up the mast and uh, they jury rigged an antenna that they sent out a distress signal and since this distress signal was picked up by like I said this uh, other ships in the sixth fleet and uh, and believe it or not the Russians picked up this distress signal and so the cat was out of the bag and then they called off the Israel called off the attack on the USS Liberty when they're they're, they're trying to sink it and uh, yeah no, was, I think the Secretary of Defense was McNamara that time and uh, and uh, President Johnson was of course steaming mad obviously this all came from the top I mean that's undeniable and if you talk about like I don't know am I allowed to say or should I venture what is the opposite word of corruption? You know, <laughs> not corruption, I don't know. But uh, when you think about corrupt presidents or, or whatever like that, and then you talk about uh, the big guy and what was on a laptop <laughs> and uh, barisma and dealings and all this kind of stuff going on today. And then you look like it still existed back then, you know.
But uh, anyway, some brave soul climbed out on the deck and they repaired this antenna, sent out a signal, and uh, then President Johnson called off the rescue attempt to rescue these people, even though some ships actually did go there and they got off some of the wounded because the sick bay was completely full, uh, you know, a lot of dead people and all, and uh, from the USS Liberty, and the ship had to make it on its own uh, back to a port. Pfft, obviously, certain people were hoping that that ship would sink. And uh, I had heard some rumor, but I didn't read it yesterday, that uh, the big admiral, <laughs> I don't know if it was the Admiral of the Sixth Fleet or some Admiral there at that time, because uh, there's a lot of Admirals and uh, or big shots. But uh, one of the one of the main people, uh, Admirals that were uh, had something to do with all of this. His name was uh, John Sidney McCain, and he is an ancestor of a senator that died some odd years ago, ran for president, and uh, lets you know that there's uh, secrets inside of families and I don't know, but, but anyhow, that's about all I have to say today, you know, and as you know, I, I majored in history and anybody that's new out here, out there listening and the, the al algorithms brought you here, like I always like to say, and if you, you like the information and one day, <laughs> When my situation gets a little bit better, I'll be able to probably put out a lot better information. Well, maybe not better information. Well, yes, sure. It depends on what's going on in the world. And and uh, I, I don't have access to any English uh, uh, history books here, really, because moving a lot in my life, you know, going from like one continent to the next and the, one country to the other country, then you lose a lot of your, your books. And, uh, and we have cancel culture and things are getting canceled online and lots of facts that... Uh, or at least what used to be facts are are deleted now, and uh, it's incredible. That's what I'm telling all of you out there that you, that, that you have these history books, these older history books. Do not throw them away. Save them because I'll tell you what, cancel culture is getting everywhere, and they're not just you know rewriting history in places like Ukraine, like they did in Germany in the 1930s. Uh, it's happening in the United States too. So anyway, like I said, if the algorithms brought you here, please press subscribe and uh, bring up my viewership. I don't know if that's going to help me or hurt me. If uh, YouTube starts watching me a little bit more closely and I'm saying something they don't like. So far, I like YouTube. I, you know, I, I, I see a lot of things on YouTube and, you know, certainly there is censorship, I believe, but it's, it's not as bad as what you see, like maybe some places like Twitter or whatever, I, I'm guessing. And hopefully Elon Musk, his takeover and trying to restore a lot of free speech on that platform might uh, influence all these platforms and, you know, keep us all safe from, uh, <laughs> from getting censored or canceled. So anyway, till the next time, and that, that'll probably be in another week. I'll add another video in a, in a week or so. So, but thanks for joining me and don't forget to subscribe.